everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ad Project Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joe Schillard from Ad Advance, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Adam Runquist. Adam, it's awesome to have you on the podcast, man. Dude, it's uh, great to finally get connected. Um, I don't know if uh, you'll get into the story, maybe I'll just tip it off now, but you reached out like, I don't know, six months ago, something like that, and at the time I had deliberately focus my attention on like, Hey, let's, let's not get on podcasts every month. And I've been pretty selective. So I actually rejected you the first time. Yep. Uh, but man, I have a, a ton of admiration for what you do. You've put out so much value to the Amazon community and you've been really, um, keen on LinkedIn and the data and access that you guys share is, has been incredible. So I was like, damn it, I got to ping this guy back and let him know I'm good to go on this because you, uh, you've done a lot for the community, man. So happy to jump on and, and chat with you. Yep. Yep. Glad I was able to run into you at the SGTG conference. I think you were running off to like a, was it a New York Rangers game? Yeah. yeah. It, it was, yeah, that was like top five sporting experiences in my life. It was pretty, pretty awesome game in the playoffs, but yeah, that was, that was fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, really appreciate you joining the podcast. And, you know, for those who aren't familiar with you, kind of give us a quick background on, uh, you know, previous before Amazon and now getting into yeah. the whole Amazon space. Yeah. I'll give you like the, the quick version. So I, I was for a long time, when I say a long time, like 15 or so years, like the typical, you know, go up the corporate ladder, corporate kind of buttoned up, buttoned up guys. So I spent the vast majority of my career actually in the en energy industry. So I was born and raised in Canada, spent some time in the energy space there. Then I moved down to Texas, where I spent north of a decade in Texas. Um, so completely opposite of the normal e-commerce, Amazon, eBay seller journey, for sure. Um, but on the tail end of, of my energy career, we were doing a lot of M&A. So very similar, ironically enough, to the Amazon aggregator model. Uh, we were buying up electricity companies in Texas, folding them in. So I was basically chasing those down. Sure. Um, and then... You know, energy is a bill, right? No one likes getting their electricity bill. It's like, and no one has really an affinity to who they buy electricity from. It's it's actually a you know pretty negative experience on the whole. But we had done a deal with Nest Thermostats, uh, so one of the guys from that invented the iPod started Nest Thermostats. They've since sold to Google, and it's a big part of their smart home stuff. But yeah. For the first time ever, I wouldn't say customers liked us, but they didn't hate us when we packaged <laughs> that electricity plan together. Yeah. So the execs are like, we got to somehow manifest our business with some kind of a physical product offering. So we ended up buying a, a brand uh, about six years ago now, I guess it was, uh, out of Utah called Goal Zero. So they do a lot of like battery generators and solar, portable battery stuff, like taking the outlet with you sure. uh, on your adventures and, and kind of providing backup for the home. So couple, I don't know, I would say six months after that transaction, um, I basically you know, moved to Utah to help kind of head up that effort on integrating the business and scaling it. And that was my like introduction to physical products. So I spent the first three weeks on the job in China, which was an interesting experience. I think we had about 18 factories. So I did the the whirlwind uh, China tour, I gained about eight pounds because of all the carbs and, and alcohol <laughs> I was drinking at all the various stops. Yeah. Um, and then one of the nuggets that we really, you know, when you acquire a business, it's like, hey, how can we you know, grow this thing? How can we expand the value, make more money, et cetera? One of the rocks we turned over was the Amazon piece. So at the time that business was 1P, which is a pretty, pretty traditional entry point into the channel, at least you know six years ago, if you are traditionally a brick and mortar business that had like POs coming in from retailers, very similar. Sure. But you give up like at least half of the margin. You don't have control of your listings. It's just a totally different dynamic. So we we discovered the the value in flipping that to 3P. The problem being though, you've actually got to run your own you know, products at that point, you got to run your own, you know, catalog, you got to do your own advertising, all that fun stuff. So that introduced me to like the end of YouTube on, on all the Amazon videos at the time. Yeah. And so it was a combination of, you know, I'd worked a lot of these executive jobs and making really good money, all the things that you'd want out of life. Then I'd gone to China and kind of understand how products are made. Then I'd kind of started to understand the economics and, and mechanics of physical products. And then the light bulb went off when I discovered Amazon. Cause I was like, Holy shit, this is uh this is interesting and this is going to be pretty compelling for a long time. Yeah. So, um, talk to my boss. I'm like, Hey, I, if it's not an issue, I see something here. I wouldn't mind doing some stuff on the side to build up some, some businesses. And he's like, yeah, go for it. So I ended up starting a home goods brand, uh, about two years to the day, um, from building that I exited it. So it was last June that I sold my first Amazon business to one of the Amazon aggregators. Uh, I've since got two more brands I started from scratch myself and then I've got, you know, equity positions in a number of other ones. So 
I am uh, obsessed with Amazon, obsessed with physical products, e-commerce. Uh, I think it's just the coolest thing you can ever do. And it's such a fun thing building these brands. So, uh, so yeah, from corporate exec energy world to, uh, <laughs> being an e-com entrepreneur and, you know, working out of, a out of an office and mountain biking and skiing most of the day. So that's my, <laughs> that's my story. That is awesome. And, and I love it too. Cause so I came from the energy industry. So I worked yeah. as a chemical engineer before, um, ended up going into corporate finance. Um, and then for me, I ended up selling my own products and that's how I got into the Amazon cool. space. So yeah, very different non-traditional backgrounds and getting into the Amazon retail space. But yeah, I, I love the story. It's fun. And I can relate quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. So with, with all your experience, I mean, growing different brands on Amazon. Um, and I saw that you just put out a great post on like your formula for success in e-com and Amazon in general. Like you, you had a lot of great different pieces when you're looking to build a brand, grow a brand, create a sustainable brand, and then, you know, keep managing that as you go. So, um, overall I wanted to know, like, if you could go through that formula for success, kind of walk us through that. And I'll just ask questions along the way. Yeah. And again, I, I've got a pretty, you know, I'm omni-channel now and, and have been from my previous experience, but I'm, you know, heavily focused on Amazon. So I think there's some distinct nuggets with Amazon. Sure. Um, I think one of the amazing things about the Amazon platform is obviously the embedded audience that you've got, the embedded trust, conversion rates, like uh, it, it's kind of a fish in the barrel scenario if you've got a really good offer on physical products. But I would say that they're typically, I would say like roughly three years behind the sophistication level in terms of the brands that are on there in terms of what you would traditionally need to do to successfully scale a physical products brand. Like sure. if you're trying to get into brick and mortar retail, if you were a DTC company that needed to create compelling ads to convert cold traffic and nurture an audience, like there's a lot more moving parts. And frankly, it's a lot more sophisticated. Whereas Amazon um, historically has been a lot easier if you've got a decent offer just to put it up there and, and things happen. Sure. So I think that the there's a lot of benefits that come with that, but I think it, it has bred some laziness and laziness in terms of uh, what brands do to actually create their products, create their offers, think about their customers. Sure. Um, so for me, the formula has always been honestly like taking the basic nuggets, like I'm not a DTC expert, I'm not an omni-channel expert, but like taking the core foundations that make those brands and those products successful outside of Amazon and integrating that wisdom and that strategic framework into finding success on Amazon. So for me, it starts with the customer. And I think that this is the inverse from uh, at least historically how a lot of people have thought about Amazon because it's so data rich, because it's so analytics heavy, you know the performance of your competition, you know what search volume is, you know what roughly revenue targets could be. Um, you just, you can walk into a Best Buy and see like, oh, this one has this many reviews and this one sells, you know, 400,000 uh, know, a month on in this month, like you just don't have that access. Sure. So because of that, I think a lot of people take the data and they use a data centric approach, which I think is important, but they lose touch of the fact that there is a human being on the other side of the screen in the search bar typing in a word that makes sense for them for the product they're seeking. And they're looking at, you know, headline ads, they're looking at sponsored products, then they're looking at the first organic, then they're looking at editorials, and they're doing all this in milliseconds as they scan what they want to pick. Sure. So for me, I think it starts with data as a supplementary element to help reduce the risk of the decisions you make. And it's a supplementary component of helping to scale and grow and identify opportunities, but it doesn't start there. Like I don't even think about Amazon when I'm creating products. I think about customers and the customer archetype that I'm looking to serve with my brand and my offer. And then I work back from there. Hey, can I get the math right on the economics? What does the Amazon data tell me? Do I have a crack at actually, you know, converting on paid ads and then winning organic SERP? And then decide if you want to do stuff. So for me, starting with the customer is probably the most critical element sure. uh, of the equation. Yeah. And I, um, I love and that I, approach too. Like just yeah. starting with the customer. Cause it, it, you know, back in the, I, I started in 2014. And so, you know, at yeah. the time, like, all right, let's go in, let's just find the biggest opportunity available. We'll look at all the numbers on Amazon. Let's craft our kind of me too product, but it's going to yep. sell anyway. It's going to be okay. Um, yep. and we, we continually see that where, um, if we have different, accounts or we'll, we'll say brands, but it's not necessarily a brand. That's a lot of scattered yep. products. It's so hard to build a sustainable business. Cause if you just yep. use the numbers, you can find those opportunities at the time. 
but yep. uh, other people are seeing the exact same opportunities. Yeah. And the market sure. is going to close there. And we see that happen quite a bit. And so I think yep. first starting with the customer and then focusing on the brand and how that all fits in um, is yep. definitely the approach that you need this day and age. You can't just yep. launch another Me Too product and have it succeed. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so then from there, I mean, with the deep understanding of the customer and like understanding some of the basic economics and mechanics on the Amazon channel, for me, it's about sculpting a really compelling but also really simple offer, right? So I think that you've got to have the right differentiation, but it's also got to be simple enough that people can digest it in milliseconds and they can digest it from a listing image. So offer is king. I mean, anything, if you don't get the offer right, everything else you do, the most strategic person, the most advanced person, there's, it's not going to work. So kind of taking that offer that, that, you know, caters that customer. And then for me, it's about building a voice. You can say of the brand, but ultimately each product is its own brand effectively on the Amazon platform. Uh, Again, I think one of the advantages of Amazon is they've really, frankly, diluted the value of a mark of like a, you know, marquee brand, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. not traditional advertising where it's all top of funnel and you build this business and then that rifles down into, you know, recognition on a, on a shelf. Um, You can get away with a brand that, or a product that no one's ever heard of, but I think you still need to represent the voice of that product and brand in milliseconds digitally as somebody sees it. So for me, um, there's probably three key components to that. One is world-class uh, visuals and imagery. And I think, again, there's a lot of cool things now that have emerged the last four or five years that let you really punch above your weight uh, as even a solo entrepreneur or a small small business to represent your, your product visually, like somebody that does photo shoots in California and spends $100,000 in your Nike and you've got actors and, and all this stuff, right? So I think, you know, visually representing the, the business and, and kind of bringing the customer along a visual journey that represents why the offer and the product is aligned for what they're looking for. Um, I think fusing in SEO, which is a key component of Amazon because it's very keyword centric, but also bringing a voice to your bullets, like speaking like the customer thinks uh, and getting into and being empathetic to how they see the problem that they're looking to solve and how they see the need that they're looking to get fulfilled and weaving that into the voice. Um, and again, this isn't like rocket science stuff. It's just like, how would you talk to your friend if you're having a beer at a pub and that was your customer? Like that kind of language, people can sense that they can sense world-class imagery and really wrapping it into something that gives them a feeling. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say that we're like solving, you know, world hunger or anything like that. Like a lot of this stuff is still pretty transactional, but customers should feel something, right? They should be compelled to, Hey, there's something different about that listening image. I'm going to click on it. Hey, these, this is a really cool story. I like how these guys have represented this. Oh yeah. The way that the words that they use in that bullet spoke to me, like they feel something that enables them to then convert quickly. So I think, you know, taking that customer offer, wrapping it into a compelling brand voice that they can feel, um, is kind of the second wave. Uh, I'll take a pause there in case you have questions, but yeah, I mean, no, I I think that's a great point. And sometimes we lose perspective of that too. Like, and so when I first launched my products, I'm a chemical engineer. And so I'm a very like features based person. Like when I'm looking at like laptops, I'm looking at specs, like I'm not looking at exactly like how it makes me feel, but I, and that, that completely set me back when I was initially launching my products because I was focused all on the features and the specs for it and not actually speaking like I'm trying to explain this or tell this to a customer. Like, you know, I sold these organic chemistry molecular model kits. They're used for old chem courses in colleges. And so I was feature based on all these atoms that included, but why are they buying it? It's so they yeah. pass their old chem class, which is really hard to do. <laughs> and so hitting on that piece and the emotional tie is one item that I personally missed at the start and until I took a step back and put myself in the shoes of my customer, um, it really helped propel me along like once I was able to hit that emotional tie. And so I feel like that's a piece that we can really miss because why is it better? Well, it has X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, what does that truly do to the customer? I I, I love that point. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And then, I mean, from there, I think probably, you know, if, assuming you get the offer, right, that's definitely the most critical piece, but I think, uh, you know, a companion or cousin to that is traffic, right? I think that he and the physical products game who can, you know, garner the most traffic with the least expense is the one that's ultimately going to win. 
Um, so for me, I think this is probably the, the part of the Amazon game specifically that's probably changed the most in addition to just some of the competitive layers and ad dynamics and stuff. But for me, it's about, I mean, the, the holy grail of Amazon is getting as much organic you know, ranking on as many keywords as possible that are relevant that you can convert on and using that because that's basically freebie stuff. You know, you take out Amazon fees, you take out shipping, you take out factory cogs. The most juice is going to be squeezed from that organic SERP and that organic performance. So I think a deep understanding of keywords, how search works, um, all the dynamics uh, of organic search on Amazon, like that's the holy grail. That's the core focus. Uh, and I would say that that's what, you know, for a long time, that's 95% of what people did. Then as ads became much more of an anti-requirement to participate, to feed that organic uh, ranking and other things, you know, ads is, is becoming increasingly, you know, important component of the game and more sophisticated component of the game. Um, but most people in the Amazon space are, are focused on those two. Um, I think the layer, the additional layer, I call it the orchestra of traffic, which is, getting eyeballs, getting visits, getting page views, and ultimately sales from a diverse set of traffic, um, of which Amazon heavily rewards now through attribution and other stuff. They love it when you bring outside traffic. So looking at outside paid traffic, uh, that makes sense with the core goal of driving organic rank more so than even making it economical from an ROI perspective. Leveraging kind of customer aligned um, audiences, whether that's Facebook groups, you know, Pinterest communities, influencers, YouTube videos, whatever it is, but people finding your product that are your customer off of Amazon, bring them to the platform. I think that's a core component. And then there's kind of a, I would say the, you know, the further more sophisticated layer, that's a lot more work, but I think kind of comes with time and is going to be required as one of the new antis of Amazon, which is building your own customer list, building your own brand and audience, you know, bringing in SEO, all those more sophisticated, longer term plays, again, that your D2C brands, that your brick and mortar retail brands have had to do for decades. Um, so for me, I think the next piece, which is hypercritical, is that orchestra of traffic and having a deep understanding uh, of all of them and making sure that you've got levers with all of them that you can drive towards your Amazon, Amazon product and rank. Sure. As you're looking at like where you spend your time on traffic, you know, so like the SEO and the paid media, the advertising, that's kind of like a given, like you're saying that you have to do as you're looking at the other different sources, like where are you spending your time right now? Is it on the influencer side? Is it on like other platforms like Google driving in? Like wh where would you say you would focus on trying to drive that outside traffic? Yeah, I, I think it's one of those, like, it's like Maslow's hierarchy, like you got to eat food first before you can have like self actualization. Yep, yep. And I would say that's on, on the traffic ladder, those those things I talked about at the end are definitely, as you rung up a little bit more towards that self actualization. So you got to get the foundations right, like you've got to structure your listing appropriately. You've got to have a really, really deep understanding of the not just handful, but dozens or hundreds of keywords that potentially are relevant for your product to drive traffic and have that focus. Um, so I would say still 80 ish percent, 85 percent of our time is spent on organic keyword performance as well as, you know, on platform advertising. I, I think that's still where you're going to get the most most benefit. But we probably go deeper, uh, certainly on the organic piece than I think a lot of people do. So I think a lot of people, they'll do keyword research when they first launch a product. They identify, hey, here are roughly the 20 words that we think matter. They put those in their title and rank order them down in the bullets and then they're set up. They set up their core pay-per-click campaigns to drive for that. And then they optimize around that for the rest of the, the product's life. Um, I think the sophistication tier where that 80, 85% of time is spent is it's not all done up front, despite the fact that that's obviously where most of the heavy lifting comes. We do a lot of stuff on a monthly basis. Like we'll analyze keyword performance up down across hundreds of keywords. We'll see what the competition's doing, especially those that are, are performing better or are on our heels. And then we basically have these go-gets every single month on keywords that we wanna run experiments on or that we wanna test, that we wanna improve on. And we'll do, okay, hey, we're gonna do this effort for three weeks and we're gonna see what the outcome is. Sure. So I think like an iterative dynamic, cause it's a dynamic thing, it's never static, but uh, you know, things change, price changes, competitors change, organic SERP changes cost per click changes, but all these things are dynamic at any given time. And so making sure that you're focused at the product level every single month on like, hey, what are we doing this month for organic search? 
whether it works or doesn't, we're going to do these things and then we're going to check the data, see how it works. And then we're going to do something new the next month. Sure. So the bulk of our time is on that, frankly, is making sure that we t keep it, keep a tight pulse on that. I think, um, directly correlated and, and kind of next in line is definitely the pay-per-click piece and, and making sure, again, it's such a dynamic thing in terms of placements and new competitors and your, you know, your pricing changes, your reviews change, but, and your cost per click changes, like all those dynamics that come into performance on pay-per-click, that's probably another really hefty element of traffic uh, that we focus on. Um, beyond that though, I think like the, the additives that not a lot of people do, but I think are gonna have to start doing them to be effective. Um, one of the core ones for us is Google Ads. Sure. Uh, again, what's really cool about Google Ads, it's very similar in terms of mechanics to Amazon pay-per-click in terms of keywords. It's structured in a very similar way. And Amazon can attribute value very similarly at the keyword level when you're running ads. So um, we use um, uh, a service called Amped. It's like a you know a tool that connects Amazon mm -hmm. attribution and lets you do Google, ad Google Ads pretty easily. So we have a whole strategy around Google Ads when it comes to launching a product, if we've lost a lot of rank and we wanna rebuild it, uh, or if we just wanna run and maintain and kind of drip some traffic in inexpensively. Uh, so I'd say Google Ads is probably the next heavy component that's uh, that's critical to both driving organic ranking and generating traffic. And then the more sophisticated layers, which again are more time consuming, they're not necessarily like I do this today and I get this result tomorrow, it requires a little bit more commitment, but we've definitely started to invest a lot more time in, is the cultivation of these like customer centric um, influencers. We like YouTube a lot because they're searchable for years uh, and it's, it's cool with video assets and stuff. So we use a lot of YouTube, uh, some Instagram. And then the other thing that's actually starting to bear fruit, which I think is going to be super interesting is like the SEO component. So sure. Amazon's clearly the leader um, in most of the Western world, certainly in the US for product search engine. But people forget about Google, like a lot of people still go to Google to seek out information on products. Uh, and the thing about Amazon, because you know, between Apple and, and Google, they're not friendly with those folks and Google's not friendly to them. So they're not, Google is not keen to organically serve up an Amazon link in their search results organically. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we actually curate a lot of, um, again, customer centric sites that aren't the brand itself. So like, let's say you're a golfer, right? We wouldn't have the name of the brand that we're actually selling on Amazon. It would be some golf interest site. And then we serve up articles and things, again, that are keyword rich and try to drive that organic results from Google to the Amazon Amazon listing. So I'd say that, that those, those more nuanced, more time consuming, a little bit less definitive ROI elements, we probably spend now 15-ish percent of our time uh, focused on those. And I think that that percentage may shift over time as, as the platform gets more sophisticated. Sure. Yeah, totally agree. And we, we've been seeing the same thing on, especially on the Google side. Um, so we've been getting into paid search for like products on Amazon within Google and we're seeing some great results. And I think like you're yeah. saying, a lot of people forget that Google is still widely used to search for products. Yeah. Um, and it, it's got a good overlap on what we're doing. And I love your perspective too, because if you look at like, all right, what the average Amazon seller or the average e-commerce seller is doing on the platform, if you want to succeed in the long term, you've got to be doing more. And so looking at yep. these other channels to really help establish yourself on the traffic side, um, you know, just, yeah, overall taking a step back and looking at, okay, here's what the average seller is doing. I've got to go above and beyond if I want this brand to be sustainable long term. And yep. so, I mean, getting into that, like from a day-to-day -day perspective too, or like a management of the account, like, are there key things that you're taking into account or how, once you have these initial pieces set up, like, you know, what's, what's the way that you structure how you're managing the account or how do you set yourself apart in the operations? Yeah, for sure. I, and I think, um, this is another really interesting component because again, none of this is rocket science or overly complicated. Um, but really quickly it can become death by a thousand paper cuts. Like, okay, finding a factory is not that hard. You know, developing, developing a product is not the end of the world. Creating the listing images isn't too hard. Creating the listings is not too hard. Doing the keyword research isn't too bad. Setting up campaigns and managing them on an ongoing basis, you know, is complicated but not the end of the world. Managing when to reorder and booking shipments and getting stuff into warehouses. Like, if you took any one of these components, like, most of us could spend a half day or like a Saturday on a weekend and become pretty dang good at any one of those components. Um, I think where 
Amazon and just business in general and physical products in general gets uh, potentially interesting operationally is that you got to do all those things all the time at once. And so it's not the difficulty, it's the complexity and the quantity, I think, that, that gets people into trouble. So for us, I think the understanding of all those moving parts, um, what are the key things with each of them? Like, I, I think one thing that locks people up, uh, whether it's traffic or any one of these things is like, I've got to be a subject matter expert in shipping, or I've got to really understand pay-per-click or any of these things. But like 70% oftentimes it's like the, or 80% if you want to use Pareto, um, is good enough in this game. So understanding those things, those levers in each one of those components that really move the needle and contribute to the success or failure of, of how you operate your business. And then focusing on those things, systematizing them, having software, having replicable, predictable things in place to make them happen is, is where the magic is. So for us, that looks like we've got a database now. I don't know the exact quantity, but I think it's probably upwards uh, north of 250 now in terms of SOPs. So sure. again, you know, setting up an Amazon product listing is not difficult, um, but you have to do it multiple times. What we do is anytime we do something that we have to do more than once, we document it. And we have a pretty distinct system on how we do that, both written, visual, video, so that anybody, whether it's me or anybody else on the team that has to do something, if we've done it once, we can go reference that in a database and find it really easily and implement it. So I think making sure that you're documenting and systematizing what are the steps that are required for each one of those nuanced areas is really important. So I think sure. like a foundation of knowledge is critical. And then you've got to determine, again, understanding the levers and what the benefit of each one of those things are which ones do we, do we need to do and which ones do we need to do on, on what cadence schedule and then who's doing them. So what are the things that we need to do every day? What are the things that we need to do every week? What are the things we need to do every month? What are the quarterly things we need to do? And then what are the ad hoc fires that come up and how do we address those? Sure. Um, I think spending some thoughtful time, like basically reverse engineering how you operate your business and thinking about it in that way is the most important. And then how can you automate some of that stuff or how can you delegate it to somebody that's you know, of the appropriate pay grade and attention on those things. Um, and then how do you make sure that you have checks and balances in terms of the, the feedback loops in terms of data and information on how those things are going? That's how I think about systematizing econ businesses. It's like taking that simple but complex functional elements and digesting them into a, a way that's scalable and that makes sure that they're, uh, you know, they're taken care of operationally. Sure. Sure. I love it. I love it. And you know, that one of the last times that you had here too is managing working capital and supply chain. And I, I think yep. this is one piece that a lot of people miss too, is that having a products business, um, it's very cash intensive because <laughs> you have to buy yep. the products up front. It takes a while for them to get to the Amazon warehouses. It takes a while to get the sale and then it takes a while to get paid. And so it can consume a lot of cash. So kind of walk us quickly through that piece. Yeah, I think, you know, again, it starts with the upfront analysis, like you're going to be wrong, you know, you're going to be wrong on a, in a good way or a bad way upfront with your analysis, right? Like you're never going to, you know, or rarely going to hit it like on the head. But I think that you've got to have the appropriate margin structure and mathematical structure with the offer that you're creating, taking into account all the things that are going to erode your margin and making sure that's what's left over especially in a worst case scenario is enough that you can turn the cash over effectively and you don't cripple yourself. So for me, I think a lot of people get over their skis a little bit because they look at it, they look at like the net margin, they're like, okay, I take Amazon fees, I take the factory costs, you know, I think I'll be able to sell it for a hundred bucks and go, right? Well, what if you, you have to sell it for 90, okay? Uh, you're probably gonna spend now 15 to 20% on ads. Did you take that into account? Okay, you thought the return rate was going to be 2%, but it's 8%. Like there's all these things that chip away and erode at what ultimately is your cash turn that you can then go use to invest in future production cycles. So I think, you know, being really, really, really thoughtful and spending a ton of time up front on understanding what those scenarios may look like is probably the most important piece, um, which a lot of people don't do. And then they find out like four or five months in like, shit, I, I didn't take those things into account and this is how much money I have. And now I got to go take out a loan if I ever want to reorder inventory and have enough cash. Mm -hmm. So I think that analysis is the most important piece. Uh, but I think beyond that, um, it's not being emotional about what you see once you've kind of put your product out into the world, right? I think a lot of times you spend a ton of time thinking about the product, thinking about the customer, thinking about the offer. You might buy molds. You spend three months developing the product. You wait two months for it to arrive. You know, you've got, you know, 
20 grand in inventory or whatever the number is. And it's like, and it's selling and it's got 500 reviews. I don't want to let it go. But like, you need to understand that sometimes there are things in your business that are a drag that even if they're making money, they're not making enough so that you can fluidly operate and scale and you need to kill some stuff. So I think having that unemotional view of what products survive, which ones don't, uh, and what point in the life cycle they are is another important element. Um, and I think beyond that, it's just like, you know, we talk about like working capital is one thing, stockouts is the other. And again, it's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't, because if you order more inventory, you're then short on cash. But if you don't order enough inventory, you lose you yep. lose sales. And that's really the, the conundrum that all of us face in this game. But I think a, a healthy recognition of the danger of stockouts is really important. A, in terms of the lost value, I mean, you can calculate that quick. If you don't have product to sell, you're going to lose whatever that net contribution margin is per unit you don't sell. But then everything else becomes harder. You lose organic SERP. You have to spend more on ads. You have to spend a month or plus getting the product revived. You may never get it back to where it was. So I think um, thinking about your cash flow and your inventory positions as an opportunity cost um, is super, super important. I mean, people agonize over, you know, spending another 10 grand on ads a month. Um, but if they were stocked out for eight days, they might have 10 grand and less value, but they don't spend as much time thinking about how much they spend on ads versus what they actually do in terms of, you know, booking shipments and getting stuff on. And what do I air freight? What do I fast boat? So, so I think, um, whether you like it or not, and it's the unsexy, unfun part of the business for a lot of people, myself included, there's a couple weirdos out there that love supply <laughs> chain and love, uh, operations and stuff, but you really do have to have that as a cornerstone of your approach when it comes to managing cash and managing supply supply chain stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen that too. Like back in the day, I mean, if you went out of stock, then when you came back in stock, you could kind of regain right where you were before. Um, yeah. Now it's honestly like you're launching a new product again, especially if you're 100%. out of stock for a while. And Sometimes so, worse because you don't get honeymoon stuff and you've got yeah, all this exactly. negative data that's accumulated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And so I, I love the approach of looking at as an opportunity cost and all right, I'm going to spend a little bit more just to make sure I'm not getting out of stock um, and really yep. focusing on that. Cause yeah, we have seen such a hit especially if you're out of stock for a while. Yeah, um, for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. And then I think there's like, there's things that other people, uh, one thing that's been interesting about entrepreneurship and just life in general, I'd say the last decade for me is, is that we're kind of conditioned to think that the things and reality that we have today is just how it is. And we don't think we can nudge that in our favor. So I'll give you a couple perfect examples. Like a lot of people don't go after um, payment terms heavily with their factories. Like we are ruthless and relentless in a good way. We're a good business partner and it's about finding success for all involved. But like I will claw and bleed blood from a rock to get 60 day payment terms. <laughs> and the reason is if I get 60 day payment terms, you know, it, it basically ships for free and I have 30 day run to get cash and I can order more. I have to be less concerned about going a little hefty on inventory. We do things like safety stock agreements where we require factories to house 30 days of inventory at the factory. So we take production costs out of the equation. So I think you've got to get really creative about understanding what your current reality is and what are drags on your working, working capital and ability to buy inventory. And then just imagine the world in a different way and go try to create it. Like, hey, what if I had payment terms? What if they held 30 day stock? What if I talked to get you know a, a cash influx where the debt was 7%, not 15%. Like you've got to challenge realities and not accept your reality as what it is in this in this game. And even if you don't get 60 days, maybe you get 30 days too. So I think challenging your own assumptions and the own your own current reality of your operational situation uh, is another like super critical thing that you know, and you'll find out like, what's the worst thing that can happen? They say no, and I've got the exact same circumstance. Who sure. cares? Yeah. And especially um, as you establish trust with your manufacturers too. Yeah, and now 100%. you can go back and all right, now they trust you more. Those 60 day terms don't look as scary yeah. as they did up front. Yeah. hundred percent. So I think like challenging your own assumptions and, and your own realities is, is something you always have to do too. Yeah. So Adam, I, I mean, so as we get into the next part, I mean, first off, go check out Adam's content um, for your content. Where should they find you? Because you've got a ton of awesome stuff out there. Yeah, honestly, like the the singular and easiest place is just type in Adam Heist on YouTube. You'll find me hit subscribe. I usually drop videos uh, every single Monday. Um, my take on the games, I think a little bit different. Like, you know, one of the things I didn't like about the space when I entered it and when I started doing the more public facing stuff is it's like this shiny toy, like here's how to get passive income and here's how to do a software filter to make hundred grand a month. Like yep. that's not my style. Uh, I'm not always right. Um, but what I like to do is like 
think about thoughtfully the things that I think are interesting with what I've learned on my journey and then share those strategically, tactically, and, and otherwise on the channel. So yeah, type in Adam Heist on YouTube and hit subscribe and you'll you'll discover my rabbit hole that is is the content on YouTube. <laughs> and that's initially how I got introduced to you too. I was seeing your face popping up on different screens for people for my team. And I was like, who, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, and so I started following along with you. And so definitely check out Adam on, on YouTube. A lot of awesome content, great perspective. I love the outside perspective, but bringing it really together on the key things that really like matter, it, it, you take it high level really well, but then take it down to the details. And so awesome stuff there. Appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, and for everybody who's listening to the Ad Project podcast, as always, really appreciate you listening, and we'll see you on the next episode. 